My name is Rose Amador LeBeau. I am President and CEO of CTC. Our mission is to help people through employment and education become self-sufficient. We have a day worker center. We have educational programs so people can get their GEDs. We serve a variety of people, people who've just become unemployed, people who have never worked. We work with homeless people. We work with people who have just gotten out of prison and have to re-enter the workforce. So we're full service. I think it's seeing people make the change, become successful, uh, make that transition, and actually having an impact on people's lives, a positive impact. To see these success stories is what it's all about. Hi, I'm Siwa Billy, Rose Amador LeBeau. And I'm Craig Pasqua, and you're watching Native Voice TV. Yes, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to learn about diabetes prevention, and with us we have Orena Flores. Welcome, mm -hmm. Orena. Thank Welcome. you. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, I have family members, friends, a lot of people I know that have diabetes mm -hmm. and have really suffered from it, from it. I've lost a really good friend who had diabetes really bad, and I think he died at 49. Mm -hmm. It's a serious problem. Tell us about it. Oh, it's so serious. It's, I'm sure all of us, indigenous people especially, can, can name at least a few people in your family, your own family, that suffer from diabetes. In my own family, my mother has diabetes. Um, my father, although he passed away at a young age, unrelated to diabetes, um, he was only 32 and he had diabetes. And, you know, it seems kind of common on reservations where in your, and, you know, growing up, it's kind of expected. You think, um, that's just natural. That's just what happens. You eat a lot and you gain weight and then all of a sudden you're hit with this sickness. And it's really common. But it's not. It doesn't have to be that way. Right, exactly. It and doesn't have to be. And, and that's why, um, you know, we're here with this program, hopefully to kind of nip it in the bud and to meet with families to prevent it, to prevent um, any further sickness, unnecessary sickness. And what program is that? This is the um, Pathways to American Indian and Alaskan Native Wellness Diabetes Prevention Program. And it, it's a 16-week uh, program, consists of a class for one hour. And it's really a study that's being financed or um, being funded by Stanford University and San Jose State University. And uh, we, we we're collecting the data in order to publish the data, our findings. And then we're gonna send it out to all the reservations and all indigenous communities to show them that this is what works. And so we divided the, the program into two groups. One is an enhanced group, which is, um, it, it's really just um, to show more cultural involvement. Um, we do things like um, any kind of ceremony. We're going to have a Bonnie Dune retreat coming up for the participants. Um, we do uh, some indigenous workouts, actually. I do that every Saturday, indigenous workouts. So what kind of indigenous uh, workout is it? I um, you know, I think it's becoming very popular in Indian country to do the powwow cardio stuff. So there's a lot of programs across, you know, nationwide that do powwow sweat. And it's really kind of the moves that you do at a powwow, whether you're a fancy dancer, jingle dress dancer, or a grass dancer, you're taking these moves and putting it into like a, like a Zumba style workout. So everybody comes together, you're all kind of doing the same moves, and it's really fun because you're dancing to powwow music. And then also, um, like the last thing we did was the, um, we had a Natives on the Move event, and we had the live drum, Manny Liares was our singer. And uh, we got everybody involved, and we were just kind of showing them a couple moves, and it was really fun. 
Oh, that sounds, it's, it, you're right, it's like Zumba, and I think that's more like salsa, but they made it into a program, so you better make your own program. Right, <laughs> exactly. That's great, that's great, because it, it, it's kind of a cultural exercise, huh? Right, and it's a lot of fun, and even people that don't know how, they don't know how to uh, do any kind of power moves or, you know, kind of off rhythm, they enjoy it very much just by doing the, the little steps. Okay, so let me, help me understand. So. The program, the Diabetes Prevention Program, long name, mm -hmm. okay, and you've got two groups that are going concurrently, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and one group, uh, there's, I assume they're going through classrooms, classroom uh, teaching, and uh, maybe how to eat and how to live, mm -hmm. and the other group is an enhanced group, and you're, sh you're sh introducing cultural mm -hmm. uh, things, native or indigenous mm -hmm. cultural things, to them, and you're looking at how they respond. Both mm -hmm. of, both of these groups right. respond, mm -hmm. and that's part of the study. Right, exactly. So that's why it's underwritten by universities. So the, right. the group that doesn't get the enhanced thing, do they know that? <laughs> yes, they do know that because uh, at the beginning I'd it's be ran. Mad. It's <laughs> ran. I know, right? That's what I was feeling. I didn't want to reveal too much to those people in the other class, but it's randomized in the beginning. So when they come and they do a baseline, which is they get their blood tests and they get weighed and um, they make sure that they're okay and good to go for the for the classes. Um, they know that they're randomized, so they can either be in the enhanced or in the standard, and they're aware of that. And they're both equally very good. I'm um, just gonna say overall, either one will help Same you. curriculum, right. yes, and they all have fun in it. Um, I know I hear from both classes, another lady that helps me, her name is Christina. She's um, from San Jose State, and, and it's really helping her too. It's, it, she's pretty young, fairly young, um, but she's able to grow a lot and get the experience, and she has fun teaching the classes as well. So it's, it's, it's a win-win, regardless of the only uh, differences in the enhanced, um, like we mentioned, it's more culturally based, because uh, that's part of the study to see, to see what works. Is it, does it work, or does it help you even more when you have culture introduced into it, or is it fine with just a standard version of it? Mm -hmm. But either one helps. Right. Now we were talking to one of our other guests about fry bread. Mm. So what's your take on fry bread? Because you know it seems to be a staple at all of the powwows, but um, there's a lot of powwows. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. There's a uh, Powell every weekend. There's going to be two this weekend in Mills College and stuff. But, um, you know, I love fry bread. I think it's delicious. But, <laughs> you know, realistically, fry bread does not come from Native people right. culturally, ancestrally. It, it Give wasn't, us the history of fry bread. It wasn't I know about, what it is, but right, I think, you know. <laughs> right. You know, coming from the reservation, um, I received commodity foods and commodity foods from the government, the golden brick cheese you know I love cheese to this day but because of that we had to figure out how to make food from that right. and a lot of it was bad greasy foods we had to use the flour the cheese the beans everything that came with it. I mean beans are good for you but uh, that goes on a fry bread and that's what we came up with we came up with the flour and the water baking soda toss it in a pan and here we go diabetes and over you know we everybody gained weight and got less active and that's really what kind of hindered us too when you eat the wrong foods you get less active and it it, it, it bothers your emotions it bothers you physically and I have nothing against fried bread but I believe that we should probably kind of cut back on that um, I suggest at the powwow since it's it's very common and it's pretty much sometimes the only food that you have to eat at the powwow Maybe cut back a little. Maybe um, make get smaller portions, or even get a plate and then share it. Share it. Mm -hmm. I've right. seen the the line at the heritage celebration <laughs> we put mm -hmm. on, and it goes around the building. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's people, hundreds well, of people well, wait, waiting. Maybe for we should have them exercise while they're in line. <laughs> yeah. Right, do some stretches. Because they'll be there a long time. Huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know, I think you know one. You talk about healthy foods, but I think you know. Our own food, our native food, yes. was healthy. Oh yes. And you know, this is not our native food. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you were talking about commodities. Right. It's not our native food. No, it's not. And they have this. Uh, most indigenous cultures, they know the the main foods that were healthy for us were were referred to as the three sisters, which was the squash, the beans, and the uh, corn. And that was all we really needed 
to live and to get by and and you know living in our in our tribal um, you know land and how we had to live like my people we lived in mud houses but who built those mud houses probably us right by our own people um, we're more active then and whatever we ate diabetes was unheard of we're like, what is that how do you get that and why would you get that but uh, you know going back to the program this is what we try to promote really you know this way of life isn't of us if you're you know proud to be who you are you're proud of your heritage let's look back at what made us so great which was we we're fit warriors in my, in my tribe the Quetzal tribe we were um, like eight feet tall and super fit you know we were, a lot, we were big and we were strong and a lot of tribes were like that and nowadays you kind of look um, you know even speaking for myself you know you need uh, we need to get back to that that's okay. great mm -hmm. and it's great that um, you're doing the prevention portion mm -hmm. I mean, it's obviously helpful if you already have diabetes mm -hmm. to, to start controlling it right but the prevention is so important yeah so how does one get involved in the program? So uh, we have a Facebook page at least. Um, it's called pa yeah. Paw for Healing. Um, if you can go onto that Facebook page, there's there's uh, n phone numbers that you can call. Um, her name is Jan. Get in touch with her. And she'll tell you a little bit more about the program. But overall, um, there are some limitations to being a part of the program, uh, mainly because, once again, this is part of a study and you, we're looking at a, cer a specific group, which are the indigenous group, uh, people of the Americas, and you have to be over 21. Um, you, you can't have diabetes already. It's fine if you're borderline, because again, we're trying to prevent. Um, and that's pr uh, pretty much it, but yeah. through the baselines, you'll have to go through um, some tests, because we want to make sure you're, you're okay enough. Sometimes people have other ailments where um, us trying to tell them to eat a different way wouldn't be such a good idea. So we do a lot of tests to ensure that um, you're safe and that you're um, that you're would you know your road to be living healthy a healthy lifestyle will be good. You're watching Native Voice TV and we're talking with Arena Flores about diabetes prevention, the effect it has on Native Americans, mm -hmm. and. Uh, things we could do through the program she's working with and that is I like the name PAW mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's P-A-A-W mm -hmm. right so let's, let's tell our audience again how they would qualify for the program you can qualify for the program if you're anywhere from the uh, Americas and you're indigenous mm -hmm. uh, so that includes South America um, North America and part of Alaska, Hawaii, mm -hmm. you know, as long as you're indigenous to this land, um, th that's who we welcome. And that's what the study is going to be on for the indigenous people and what works. Oh, wonderful. Okay. And we were talking about some of the things, a lot of activities, a lot of fun things. So that we'll, we can go to the website, get your information, and sign up. Mm -hmm. So let's learn a little bit about Arena. Mm -hmm. Where are you from? Tell us about your heritage and your people. Yes, so my maiden name is Arena Monahan, and I got married a couple of years ago to a wonderful man who's also a Southern traditional dancer. He is a uh, Yaki and Apache. But um, I'm from Winter Haven, California, and that's um, near Yuma, Arizona. A lot of people know that movie 310 to Yuma. I have friends that joke about that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a small reservation, probably consisting of seven to 10,000 members. Um, and I've, I was actually born here in San Jose, but when I was two years old, my, my mom and my dad decided to move us back to the reservation, and that's where I grew up for most of my adolescent years. And, what um, was that experience like? Oh, it was, I didn't know any other world besides living on a reservation. I, um, I went to a res school, you know, I had res friends and res dogs, and, uh, <laughs> and m my family lived close to each other, and I didn't know that there was any other life outside of the reservation. And then um, as I got older, um, I got involved in a lot of the traditional dances, the traditional uh, ceremonies and things that we'd have on the reservation, um, just being a part of the community. And then um, my dad had passed away while we were still on the reservation, and so my mom decided to move us back up here because she grew up here 
um, in her teenage years and she worked out here, went to school out here. Was she out here on relocation? Or? Yes, actually. Um, my, my grandparents, I think it was in the 50s, they were relocated out here in San Jose. Oh. And, mm -hmm. um, but they couldn't make it up here either because as, as you know, they, they gave you a little bit of money for that to come out here and it just didn't work out. It, they didn't make it. So they had to move back to the reservation. So it was a lot of back and forth. Uh -huh. But my mom was pretty familiar with San Jose. So that's where she brought us as we got older because I have two other sisters. So we're, we're all together. So did you go to school here at all in San Jose? I did, and I wasn't a very good student because I went to <laughs> different <laughs> high schools, but uh, all over the Bay Area because I just wasn't used to it, you know, uh -huh. being on the reservation, and it was so strange to me coming to school up here, and there's all these mixed people, and I mean, don't get me wrong, on the reservation, there's mixed people as well. Um, you know, we have the whites, and we have, we're so close to the border, we have Mexicans, we have blacks, but up here, it was a different vibe. It was almost as if every, nobody had a culture. And that was strange to me. And um, I wasn't very used to it, so I didn't get along with people <laughs> in school. Well, that's what I was curious about, you know, how the difference or the comparison of, you know, going to school on the reservation and then mm -hmm. going to an urban school, mm -hmm. you know, how, how did that affect you? Yeah, you know, on the reservation, you, you had more of an identity because you were among your people and you knew your, your house was just down the street. You knew... Uh, the ceremonies that went on, you knew your culture. But up here, it's almost like it doesn't matter sometimes. Like, um, it doesn't matter what your culture is. And that was back then, in the 90s or early 2000s. Now, I see a lot more young people trying to um, indulge or trying to find out more about their culture, which is a good thing. And I think that's because um, we've kind of learned. We've kind of learned um, where we, it was taken away. The culture was mm -hmm. taken away, so now, uh, especially my generation, um, we're trying to um, bring back the languages, we're trying to bring back the dances, we're trying to bring back just the community involvement, and that's a good thing. Yeah, it's, it's part of a plan right. to, to get you to forget your, your past mm -hmm. and, and the, the heritage you've grown up with or didn't have, and then marginalize it, mm -hmm. and sooner, sooner or later you'll forget it. You're right. But that is tough because I grew up in my tribal homeland of Oklahoma, and then coming out here to California, yeah, it was cultural shock, mm -hmm. and um, uh, it took a while to get adjusted. And I can see why so many um, natives and tribal people come in to an urban area and go back. Right. Um, and it, it's it's really no fault of their own. It's just you know the government or whomever wants to push people you know into the society, mm -hmm. and you know they probably thought they were doing them some good. You know, Putting them, making, or maybe not, or not. Yeah, or that, yeah. <laughs> I think the whole That's goal was thing, assimilation, yeah. you assimilation. know, and, and but, uh, be like us. But and then that's kind of what happened with the food. And then you mm -hmm. talked about the the food stuff, you know, mm -hmm. the commodity food. I mean, it's like cheese. That was, you know, that's certainly not something we ate, you know, in, in mm -hmm. Oklahoma. But it's delicious. Uh, yeah, it, it, it <laughs> is, and it gets you hooked. Mm -hmm. And and then the flour and 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 stuff. That's not mm -hmm. that's not natural. Remember, right. We're only about a hundred years, for some of us, from being hunter-gatherers. Mm -hmm. And you talked about the healthy foods. There's also, um, you know, we used to hunt. You know, my dad and I used to go deer hunting. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and and fishing. Fishing. And now we're so far from that. You know, I wanted to share. I had met. Um, actually, my husband and I had met this um, this man. I think, uh, actually, for the life of me, I can't remember where he was from, but it was from South America. And he came up here, and he was talking about how strange it was that he couldn't hunt. And he was trying to, and his uh, friends that he met um, were telling him, no, you can't shoot deer, you need a permit for that. And he said, what's a permit? What's that? Why do I need that? This is food for my family, why can't I do that? And that's something that's totally gone um, from our people, at least in the urban communities. I know there's a lot of tribes up north that still hunt, and it's great, a wonderful thing, a wonderful thing to, to uh, teach your children to get involved um, culturally, and to remember that, to keep that, um, that memory alive. Yeah, um, when you look at, now they have all the health food stores that they go, people have to pay extra money at the health food store to eat what we were eating before, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, having said that, I, I was actually thinking, I thought it was a little strange coming up to the Bay Area. You know, people in the Bay Area in California, 
um, are known for being health nuts. <laughs> but I was wondering why isn't the indigenous community like that? Mm -hmm. At least some of us are, you know, some of us are and some of, a lot of us aren't though. Right. Um, so I was, I was, you know, understanding that this program is kind of a way of introducing, you know, this urban life, uh, this, you know, society that we live in today in, to something familiar. So if we're not used to reservation life or cultural life, living out here in the city, how are we going to implement that? How are we going to implement something that we're familiar with as indigenous people? And, you know, Silicon Valley is known for, you know, it has eBay and all that mm -hmm. and Google and, and we're known for that technology. So let's use that. We're going to use that to and put it as part of our program, which it is. We have digital storytelling, which is um, the participants in the program can talk about themselves, show pictures, and really it kind of triggers um, memories of where they're from, memories of who they are, and that's kind of a thing that we want to, you know, to implement as well. Now, do you have the stories on your website, mm -hmm. or is there a way people can see the digital stories? They're not um, accessible to the public only because sometimes the people that make them, they like, oh, I don't want anybody to see it. But we'll share, uh, we'll share it among our participants in the class. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to get a few of them that are willing to share in the public, which would be great. It would be great to share with anyone. Oh, that's great. And like y your parents went back on relocation and the ones who stayed here, their children, a lot of them did not have the exposure to their, their culture mm -hmm. or their, their tribe, you know, tribal ways or mm -hmm. anything because they were taking, well, the whole thing was, you know, mm -hmm. called assimilation, mm -hmm. culturation. And of course it worked to a certain extent mm -hmm. and it's so important that like your program is helping bring that back as part of the program. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. and. It's not just our program, our, pro, our, our board actually has been around for a few years, um, but that's also just adding to the many programs, Native American programs that are out here in the Bay Area that are doing a great job of trying to provide a place. And that's really what we wanna do because San Jose, um, you know, we have the American Indian Alliance, we have the um, Indian Health Center, but sometimes there, there needs to be more. Sometimes there needs to be more provided. So what we have is a, um, a facility that has a gym, a swimming pool, uh, we have a weight room, we do aerobics, you know, so to speak, like the powwow aerobics stuff. And it's great to have that available for people that are looking to, because I hear a lot of Native people saying, oh, I went to the Zumba class, or I went to this class, and we're like, why don't you come to our class, which is a powwow. You know, you'll be among, among your own, and it, it'll be great, it'll be fun. So that's just kind of what we're trying to provide for the Native community, is a place where they can go play basketball, or anything that they need to learn tennis. Um, Craig has taught some tennis classes, or just for fun, mm -hmm. at the Timpani Center before, but we need a place and we need a facility for the community. Yeah, that's we what do. Craig's been saying. That's mm -hmm. <laughs> saying that for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do need that. And hopefully, with a lot of people, like Lorena getting involved, and uh, we had a gen another gentleman, Vernon, Medicine mm -hmm. Cloud was on, and he's talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. Get these young people energized yes. into seeing, you know, that that desire, that, w that vision you know, that we had, we want to see, because it's important to future generations mm -hmm. and then it's important Absolutely. to you know, our, our elders to respect them. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's just something that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. it's, it's time. Mm -hmm. so. Right, it's, it's time. So you also do some dancing. Too. Yeah, I do dancing myself. I've been dancing since, well, Fancy Shawl, I started um, when I was eight years old. And it, was, it wasn't a fluke, but it wasn't something I was very interested in. And then my, my aunt, my great aunt actually had said, oh, I want you to dance with my niece, so I'm gonna make you this outfit. And I just said, okay. <laughs> so she made me an outfit and I went out there and then I was like, oh, I was hooked. I loved it. I dance everywhere. You know, I travel everywhere. Um, we'd even come up here for the Stanford powwow um, from all the way down there. It's like oh, wow. a 10 hour drive. We'd come up here and, and I just had fun. And then I started dancing jingle and I've been doing that ever since. We do a lot of traveling as well. My husband and I, we, um, we dance for a, a native ministry and um, we're actually be gonna be going to Mex New, or Mexico this year, Nogales, Mexico. Wow. And we're bringing some of the dancers from the Bay Area as well. And we're gonna go down to a, a festival over there. So we do a lot of that. I've been dancing for a long time. Wow, what kind of festival is that? It's supposed on? to be um, like an indigenous gathering of the different native tribes that are down there in Mexico. So we're gonna meet with a, probably about four other tribes and they're gonna do their dances and we're just gonna do powwow dancing. Mm -hmm. So powwow dancing isn't primarily my, my culture, 
um, we have the bird dancing, um, very beautiful um, presentation of, of, of that. Um, very beautiful story too. But I do the jingle dancing, which is from the Ojibwe tribe. Um, a, a lot of the times when you're doing that, it's better to get permission before you start doing something like that because it's not my tribe and it's not. But if somebody asked you to, like I was, um, somebody had asked me to from the Ojibwe, she's actually from the Red Lake Nation. Um, that's where I got my, my start in the jingle dress mm -hmm. dancing because you have to represent the tribe and you represent um, a culture and you represent right. a story, which is a healing. And what is your dance again? Tell me about that. The jingle dress? No, your, your tribal the dance. The bird dancing, yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, we have um, these gourds that come from the ground. It's like from the squash. And they make these gourds out of them. So it's, it's kind of a rattle-like, except they're big. Mm -hmm. But they, um, they sing, the men sing of stories of, of how the land used to be. They sing of our traditions. Like one of the stories is that where we're at, even though we're in the desert and there's, it's totally dry and there's sand everywhere, uh, we tell the story of at one point that whole area was underwater. And we used to sing of the whales that would come through the rivers there, or um, the ocean was there at one time. And that's primarily what the songs will talk about, history. So it's a very um, beautiful, um, slow moving dance for the women. And then sometimes we, like in all traditions, we challenge the men. So we have that portion in our dances as well where we challenge the men. And it's really physical. Like uh, you have to be pretty fit, kind of like the Mashika dancers that have those awesome thighs and right. calves. <laughs> <laughs> it's something like that as well. But it's a beautiful sight to see. And hopefully we can bring a group up here to demonstrate that. Wow, mm -hmm. that would be interesting to mm -hmm. see. Same at the Heritage Celebration. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. So do your sisters dance too? Yes, uh, my older sister dances. Usually, and, and I say she dances because I dance too, but I think she's more into that than I do because I choose to kind of represent the jingle dress. Um, but she dresses in a traditional dress and um, she'll go to the, the gatherings down south. They have a lot of gatherings, bird dance gatherings, and um, she participates in that. Wow, mm -hmm. you guys wow. are really active and it's wonderful to hear. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for helping me out, Craig. Thank you, Rose. we do pleasure. every week. <laughs> and thanks, Rena. We really appreciate you being here and educating us with all this uh, information on the diabetes program. Thanks Absolutely. for joining us. Like us on Facebook, and we'll see you next week. Indigenous soul, indigenous soul. Indigenous soul, indigenous soul. Indigenous soul, indigenous soul. Indigenous soul. Indigenous soul, indigenous soul.